Okay, well, in the interest of our time, um, I think we can go ahead and get started. I think to lead us off, uh, Wesley, who is on the call, um, is going to give us a brief introduction to the project, and then we'll go through and do some introductions for the project team. So Wesley, if you don't mind um, going ahead and, and getting us started here. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Wesley Brown with Central Atlanta Progress in the Atlanta Downtown Improvement District. Um, we represent downtown Atlanta, and we are working on this project in collaboration with Midtown Alliance, who represents Midtown Atlanta. And uh, we recently received funds uh, from the Atlanta Regional Commission that are allowing us to study um, what's happening on our curb uh, citywide, or not citywide, excuse me, in Midtown and downtown. And so um, we have hired a very um, proclaimed uh, group of consultants and they are helping us look at some of our issues and uh, we welcome um, this group to weigh in on those issues that we believe to be that need to be studied and um, we've looked at some or we've spoken to rather some other folks throughout the city um, from transit providers uh, ride share deliveries um, property managers owners stakeholders of, of all backgrounds to really hone in on the, the variety of issues that exist and knowing that um, your issue may not be my issue and my issue not, might not be your issue, but the solutions, um, hopefully we will we will arrive at solutions that make sense for, for all of those issues. So um, if anyone else from downtown or midtown is on the call, I invite you to um, just say hello now and then we'll turn it over to the team and take it away. Hey, Wesley. Long time. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Hello, this is Robin, and I'm in Midtown. And I'm Linda. I'm in Midtown, too. I'm Matthew, downtown Midtown. I'm Jennifer, and I'm uh, downtown. I'm Dita. I'm Midtown. I'm Susan, sort of in between downtown and midtown. I am. Um, I'm Holland. I'm in downtown. I welcome all of the, the greetings. I, I, I realize my, my message was a little bit misleading. I was hoping the folks that work for Central Atlanta Progress and Midtown Alliance would chime in. I suspect that there will be much conversation following this meeting, so you would know of who that you can connect with um, if you have anything that is not discussed, you can follow up with on the meeting. So um, I see Dan on the call and Stacy, if you want to just chime in and just introduce yourselves really quickly and then we can turn it over to the group because I know we've only got 55 minutes. And they put minutes. their emails in the chat please. Absolutely do that. Hey everyone, this is Dan Horgan. I'm the Director of Transportation for Midtown Alliance. Great to be here. Hey everyone, I'm Stacey Rollman. I'm the Transportation Program and Event Coordinator at CAP. Okay, uh, well, thank you, Wesley and, and Dan and Stacey and everyone else who's joined today. Um, I can go ahead and, and introduce myself. Um, so my name is Jason Novsam. I am with uh, the consulting team um, with the firm Nelson Nygaard. I am a senior associate with Nelson Nygaard. Uh, I am based in Boston, but I am a former resident of Midtown Atlanta for a very long time. Um, so very excited to work on this project. And I'm also joined by several others from our consulting team today. Um, to, I'll hand it over to them to introduce themselves, um, starting with Evan. Great, thank you, Jason. Hi, everyone. My name is Evan Costa Liola. I am a principal at Nelson Nygaard, and I'm serving as the project's principal in charge. I'm very excited to be working with you and collaborating with you today. I'm going to hand it over to Carmen. Hi, everyone. I'm Carmen Chen. I am with Nelson Nygaard as well, senior associate serving as the deputy project manager. Um, I'll hand it over to Matt. Hello, my name is Matt Kaufman. I'm with Urban Trans, and I am helping on public involvement and data collection side of the project. Let's go with Jody next. Hi, everyone. I'm Jody Gray, and I'm also with Urban Trans, and I will be helping out with the public engagement as well. 
And I'm not sure who to turn it over to next, Jason. <laughs> I, I think that may be everyone uh, from our team. So uh, unless I'm missing someone, and I'll just add that our project manager for this project from the consulting side is Lauren Matern. And unfortunately, she's not able to make it today. Um, she is dealing with some power outage issues uh, in Texas, as I'm sure you all are, are familiar with, uh, but I'm sure uh, you'll be hearing from her in the future as well. Um, so I think that does it for our introductions, and I'll just go ahead and, and uh, walk us through a brief presentation before we get into some of the interactive parts of this meeting. And I'll just ask that everyone, uh, please do remain muted until we get to our question and answer period, uh, but please feel free to post your comments and questions in the chat at any time. And then when we do get to the Q&A period, uh, we'll go through and try to answer as many of those as we can and you know, call on folks who may have questions uh, to hear from you directly as well. Okay, so I'll go ahead and, and get started here. Um, so you've heard from us already, um, you know, our team is led by Nelson Nygaard and our goal in terms of how we approach the curbside is to put people first, right? So we really believe that curbs are all about people, uh, not just vehicles. And that's really the lens through which uh, we'll be looking at this plan. In terms of the project itself, you already heard from Wesley a little bit. Um, about that, but I'd love to expand on that. So um, you can see our study area here on this map on the right. Um, we are looking at almost the entire Midtown and Downtown Community Improvement Districts, as well as some adjacent areas. Um, so that's our study area. Our first task here is really to understand the existing curb environment, right? So we are mapping all of the curbs in Downtown and Midtown to understand how they're regulated. Um, you know, what are the assets that are already out there? Then uh, we'll be looking at challenges and conflicts between modes. So we're really hoping that all of you here today can help tell us more about that and maybe fill in some of the gaps um, that, that we have. Uh, of course, another big goal here is to bring all of our curb stakeholders together. So this is our first public workshop, but we've also been having a series of specific stakeholder meetings and we will have additional public workshops as well. So stay tuned on that. And then finally, all of this is leading to envisioning a dynamic curb future. We really wanna set clear goals and policies that can lead us to you know, a very actionable final plan. Um, so that's where this is all headed at the end of the day. In terms of our schedule, uh, here we are in February. So you can see we're sort of wrapping up our inventory and assessment process. So we'll be talking to you about some key findings from that today. Uh, then we'll be starting with a best practices review, uh, looking at practices from around the country that may be able to help Atlanta's curbside and our stakeholder engagement process will be continuing um, you know, for many more months, but ultimately we'll be delivering a final plan uh, likely sometime in October. In terms of our agenda for today, uh, we'll just talk a little bit about why it's so important to manage the curb, go through some of the challenges and opportunities that we found already, talk about the next steps in the plan, and then go into that question and answer period. And then we'll have some interactive exercises as well. We'll go into some breakout rooms and Matt will tell us a little bit more about that um, at the end of our presentation. So let's start here. So why do we care about managing the curb? So there's obviously many different reasons why the curb is important, but we wanted to introduce four of the most important ones here. So the first is that the curb is a connector. So regardless of how we travel, um, whether it's by bus or by car or by bike or something else, chances are we have to use the curb at some point to do that, right? So the curb really connects us as people uh, to our transportation options. So that's really the most obvious uh, you know, value of the curb. Uh, but another really important aspect of the curb is it's really a major asset. It's one of our largest public resources. It's part of the street. And the street is of course, uh, the single biggest part of the public realm in any city, right? It's something that we all use on a regular basis. So we really wanna make sure we're managing that uh, in a way that, that works for all of us. The next reason is that the curb is multi-purpose. So as we've all seen in the last few years, and particularly in 2020, there's just a growing number of, of different and new demands placed on that curb. It's not just about parking or about buses or even about bikes, uh, but of course we have ride hailing, we have Uber and Lyft, we have food delivery, we have online shopping that's leading to all these loading needs. So uh, and of course, we even have on-street dining and retail, um, you know, so important during the pandemic as well. So we want to consider all of those things. And then finally, 
the curb is really a means to our community goals. Uh, we really should be thinking about this as a way to accomplish those broader goals for our community, whether it's safer streets or more equitable transportation options or uh, increased economic development. Uh, the curb can really, really help us if we manage it right uh, to accomplish those things. So in terms of some of our specific objectives, uh, the first and perhaps the biggest one here is um, creating more equitable curbs that really work for people. Uh, so this equity objective recognizes that, you know, providing better access at the curb to transit, to bikes, to walking, to other uses, that's going to expand access to opportunity for all road users, not just people uh, who can afford a vehicle. So to talk a little bit more about that, if we think about how people commute today, and this is from Atlanta's transportation plan, about 83% of people typically are driving when they commute today, and about 17% are doing something else. And the way that we manage our curbs really reflects this, right? So the majority of our curbs right now are used for driving of one kind or another. That's an expensive mode with, you know, kind of low person throughput. It's not that efficient. Um, and what we see is that much of downtown and midtown has little curb access because of that, because we need that curb space for cars. So there's not much space for other uses. In the future, when we look at the goals for Atlanta, again, from Atlanta's transportation plan, we see that we expect only 65% of people to be driving and a larger share of people to be doing some of these other things. And that means we need to manage the curb accordingly. We need to find that dedicated space for buses, for bikes, uh, for scooters, for all of these different and great uses of the curb. So our next objective here is really about communicating value. So what do we mean by that? So what we see now is that a lot of Atlantans' attitudes toward the curbside are really influenced by kind of some common negative experiences we might have. So maybe it's you received a parking ticket because regulations were kind of confusing somewhere you needed to park. Maybe you're searching for a place to park uh, somewhere downtown or midtown and you couldn't find it. Uh, maybe you're being forced out into a travel lane when you're biking because someone's double parked in your bike lane or they're loading there. Um, so these are all kinds of experiences that we see now. Um, what we want to do is really communicate the value of the curb to everyone and you know really find the more positive aspects. So you can see some of these images here from Atlanta, um, you know, portraying some of these issues that we've seen, regulations that are maybe unclear, enforcement that's not present, and particularly um, you know, conflicts created by loading are not really resolved. And we'll talk uh, more about all of these as, as we move on. So our next objective here is really creating decision-making clarity. So there's so many different groups and organizations that are involved with managing the curb. And you can see some of those here in this, in this chart. We won't talk about every single one, but of course it starts with the Atlanta City Council and various committees who actually create the code um, that manages our curb. Then we have enforcement, so Atlanta Police Department and ATL Plus, um, your parking management vendor are the main ones doing that. Um, then we have the groups that actually plan and deploy assets at the curbside. So that's pl primarily Atlanta Department of Transportation, who actually puts up the signage and does other things to manage. And uh, our communicators, so groups like Midtown Alliance, Central Atlanta Progress, who actually work with people to understand goals for the curb. And then there's our interpreters, who are really just all of us, right? Anyone that uses the curbside, um, we need to understand those regulations to be able to use it right. Um, so quite a lot of different groups involved and we want to help everyone to, to be able to work together. Moving on, we just have our last uh, primary objective here, which is making our curbs adaptable, right? So the pandemic in particular has really revealed uh, the growing pressures on curbs and on streets as a whole. And we want to make sure that our policies and curbside designs reflect the shifting nature of the curb and allow us to really leverage the curbside as a way to keep people safe. Uh, to keep them healthy and to keep them employed as well. So um, certainly something we want to consider. So moving on here, um, I'll dive into some of the challenges and opportunities at the curbside that we've identified already. And then again, we just ask that you think about these and you know if there's something that you'd like to comment on or that we've missed, you know, drop that in the chat. And when we get to our question and answer period, you know, we'll try to answer uh, as many of those as we can. So we'll start here. So you can see this map on the right. 
this is showing all of the existing curb regulations in downtown and midtown that we've discovered through our mapping process. So we'll talk about some of these in more detail. Um, but the first thing that we wanted to call out here is that almost 80% of all of the curbside in downtown and midtown is not actually accessible. It's marked as no parking or no stopping for one reason or another. And we'll talk about those reasons. But you can see that on the chart here on the left, 80% of the curb is not actually accessible. And in most cases, that's due to the fact that the curb lane is actually being used as a travel lane for cars. So of course, if it's being used as a travel lane for cars, you can't park there, you can't load there, um, you, know, you can't be doing all of these other different things there. So that's the main thing we noticed. You also have about 15%, and that's the gray color here, um, of your curb that's being used for curb cuts. So of course, curb cuts allow people to access buildings off street, so they're important, uh, but you don't wanna have more of those than you need because of course you can't do anything else at a curb cut. You also have about almost 20% of your curb that um, is being used for bike lanes. So bike lanes are certainly present and growing, but again, most of that inaccessible space is due to traffic lanes for cars. So moving on, just some images here to explain kind of what we're talking about. Um, when we say a curb is inaccessible, it could be being used for uh, a bike lane or more commonly like this image on the right, this is Peachtree Street. You know, you just have a travel lane uh, right up against the curb. So again, you can't really do anything else with that other than have cars driving through. That's not to say that these areas don't have value. Of course, we need to move cars, uh, you know, efficiently through downtown and midtown, but it does mean um, that a lot of your curbs are, are really inflexible. So moving on, when we look at the remaining 20% of space that actually is accessible for different uses, um, we see that about 34% of that space is being used for metered parking. And then another 26% is unregulated parking. And then about 17% is being used for bus stops or bus loading areas of some kind. And then of course, there's lots of other uses as well uh, we won't talk about every single one in detail, but those are sort of the three main ones that we see. So what does this all actually look like when we get out to the street uh, with the way we're managing today? So perhaps, again, the most obvious thing we see is because of how many people drive to and from downtown and midtown, we have these high traffic volumes. And that means we're using these curb lanes for travel lanes. When you do that, you can't really use them um, for these other uses. We're also seeing uh, scooters, and other uh, emerging mobility uh, devices like that. They don't really have dedicated space. They're kind of having to find their own way. We see all this demand from online shopping and delivery services and ride hailing, Uber and Lyft. Um, they don't really have dedicated space to go either, right? So what happens is they often double park. They create conflicts when they're loading with buses, with bikes, with other users, um, and that can cause some difficulties as well. So the goal is in the future, uh, make sure we have more flexible curbs that actually give dedicated space to all of these different uses. So our bus stops are secure, they're comfortable, there's no loading conflicts there because it's really space just for buses. We have dedicated curb space for Uber and Lyft, for food delivery, that sort of thing. Make sure that they have a place to go. Um, our scooters have a place where they can park and they're not conflicting with pedestrians or others. And then because we're optimizing curb management and our auto mode share is dropping in the future, now we don't need all those travel lanes. Maybe we can start using them uh, you know, for something else, whether it's a bike lane or some other type of, of use. In terms of parking, let's talk a little bit more about that. So we do have about uh, 1,800 metered parking spaces in downtown and midtown. And if you look at the map here, um, you can see the red areas are where that metered parking is located. Um, that's actually not a huge amount of on-street parking given just how many people are in downtown and midtown on a daily basis. So our feeling is that off-street parking is sort of filling the gap um, where that's concerned. Another thing that we'll be uh, doing here is we'll be looking at parking utilization data um, a little bit further down the line to understand where are the busiest spaces, where are spaces that are a little bit less busy and figure out maybe how we can you know, move some of those regulations around. In terms of transit, um, of course, Midtown and Downtown both have a, a great deal of transit service. Um, there's quite a few MARTA rail stations in our study area and a lot of bus activity as well. So areas like Five Points and Civic Center and Midtown uh, obviously have a lot of, a lot of buses. 
And a lot of times they are interacting with the curb. So we want to make sure that that's working for them. In terms of some of the issues we see with buses using the curb, what we're finding is that bus stop lengths are not always long enough to accommodate just how many buses and how much activity there is. And the other issue we're seeing is that the regulations at those bus stops are not always being enforced, right? So for example, Civic Center Station, um, there's so many buses there that you know sometimes they're running out of space and there may be conflicts. It's not always being enforced there, creating some problems. Um, we're also seeing that uh, transit providers typically are putting up their own signage while the city deals with signage related to other things, right? So that can mean that regulations become a little bit unclear at times in bus areas uh, because the signage isn't always coordinated. Moving on, talking about bike lanes and um, you know our light individual transport lanes or lit lanes. Um, you do have almost 120 miles of these lit lanes and trails. Of course, there are still some critical gaps in Midtown and Downtown. Um, but the main thing we, we need to pay attention to here in terms of the curbside is of course that intermodal conflicts are going to always be higher in a really busy commercial area um, like Downtown and Midtown where there's lots of loading and other things happening. We really wanna um, consider that. What we've seen is that there is a $100 fine on the books for parking in a bike lane or a $1,000 fine uh, for loading in a bike lane. So those, those policies are there, but it's unclear to, you know, to what extent that's really being enforced, right? How often does a double parked truck in a bike lane really get that, that fine? Um, so that's something that we've observed as a potential issue as well. In terms of pedestrians, obviously pedestrians interact with the curb as well. Um, so if you look at this map on the right, what we've done is mapped uh, the density of curb cuts, right? So wherever um, you have more curb cuts, that tends to be a less comfortable and a less safe place for pedestrians to be. Um, so we certainly want to take a look at that and make sure in the areas that we have the most pedestrians, you know, we're trying to cut down on, on the number of curb cuts that we have. And in terms of micromobility uses, uh, like our scooters, you know, right now there aren't really dedicated parking corrals um, for these types of vehicles. So what happens is they're on the sidewalk and you do have some narrow sidewalks. So in that case, you know, conflicts between pedestrians and scooters certainly come up. Uh, we don't really have dedicated space for our scooters. So there is code on the books, again, to manage them. Um, they're not supposed to be riding on the sidewalk, but again, it's unclear how much that's enforced. So um, something we wanna keep looking at as well. So now we can talk about uh, urban freight and loading. So about 8% of your accessible curb space is used for loading zones. And our feeling is that this is likely just not quite enough to accommodate how much demand there really is for loading uh, in downtown and midtown. And that's something we'll be diving into more um, you know, as we get further along in the process as well. Another issue here is that your parking enforcement vendor is limited by, I believe, uh, city or state code that they're not able to enforce violations happening in loading zones unless they are sworn law enforcement officers. So law enforcement, of course, does help with the enforcement as well, uh, but your actual you know, parking management vendor, they're often not able to do that. So that creates some challenges as well. And moving on, um, you know, we can talk about our ride hailing and our food delivery services. Um, you know, this is certainly a fast growing activity type in 2019 already, 30% uh, of Atlanta residents had indicated that they had used ride hailing in at least once in the last three days. And I'm sure that number is gonna continue to grow. And often these vehicles are of course, double parking. Uh, they're parking in bike lanes, they're creating conflicts. So this is another area that we wanna make sure we look at um, some possible solutions, both on the street, as well as uh, working with those vendors themselves and in their apps to make sure that um, you know, they're behaving the way that they should be. Moving on, um, again, our curbs and our streets are not just about movement. Uh, we wanna make sure that we have recreational space, dining space, and other outdoor space. Again, so important, especially um, during the pandemic, but also looking into the future. Streets are really about people. And you know, we, want, we wanna provide these spaces as well and make sure that our curbs are, are working um, for everyone. So moving on, um, we're just gonna pause on this slide for a moment. So you can see this map here. 
and some of these streets called out. So these are some of the key curbside demand corridors that we've identified so far as potential problem spots or really busy curb areas. What we'd love for you all to do right now is go into the chat and tell us what you think about these corridors or if there are things that we've missed and areas that you know have problems that you don't see here. Tell us about those because we want to make sure you know, we really look at every place that, that needs that extra attention. So I'll just pause here um, for a minute. And again, um, we'll have to move on, but um, you know, please continue to post your, your comments and questions in the chat. And I'll just give a couple more minutes um, for people to go ahead and do that. Great, so we're getting lots of great comments here. Um, so that's so helpful to us really, because all of you are there on the ground every day, um, you know, you're seeing what's happening and we just wanna really make sure that we get um, your voice in, in this plan as well. If I could add, Jason, it would be helpful. I'm seeing a lot of streets listed, which is great, but if you could name an intersection or an address to really hone in. I know that some streets are more challenging than others where it may be several blocks, but if we were able to focus in, like this is the spot I'm talking about, it'll help the team really look at what's going on. Great, thanks, Wesley. So I'll just give a few more seconds um, for this. We do have, again, our question and answer period coming up. So there'll be plenty more opportunities um, as well as in our breakout rooms to talk to us and, and tell us these spots. Um, and you know, so just go ahead and keep posting those. Um, we are gonna do some interactive polling as well. Um, and I do wanna, wanna save time for that. But again, this is um, you know, super valuable stuff. So thank you so much. Okay, so um, I'm gonna move on here and I'll just quickly talk us through some of the next steps and then we'll go to that question and answer period. Um, so there's a few things happening next. So the first is that we'll be finalizing that curbside inventory that you saw, uh, making sure that that's really accurate. And we'll be looking at the parking demand as well. Again, figure out where the busiest spaces are and where the less busy spaces are. We'll keep um, going with our stakeholder outreach and public outreach, looking at some of these best practices developing some corridor typologies. And then we'll really be zooming into these problem corridors um, that you all are you know, posting about right now and trying to make sure we understand the problems there. And then that brings us to developing our strategies and of course our final plan. There will be an additional public workshop, so stay tuned for information about that. Um, and we'd love to have you all join that as well, as well as you know, bring more and more of your friends, because again, we do wanna hear um, from as many people as, as we can. And with that, um, I'll just move into our question and answer period. So um, Carmen, if you could help us by um, you know, sorting through some of the questions that have come through. And then we'd also ask people um, if you can raise your hand virtually in Zoom, um, Carmen can also go ahead and, and try to call on you and, and you know, we can hear from you directly. So we'll spend you know, a few minutes on this and I'll just ask Carmen to, to start that process. I'll start off with um, some of the few questions that were already listed earlier. So the first one is, what does, oh, we already answered that. The first question is, if we create space for ride hail and delivery services, will we be able to charge for them appropriately using that right away? That, that's a great question. And I'm sure others on the project team may have comments on that as well. But um, you know, part of this process will be looking at new technologies that can do exactly that, right? So there are emerging technologies 
um, you know, which can dynamically price the curb. So you can have a designated area for those Uber and Lyft rides to pull up um, and they can actually pay based on how much time you know, they spend at the curb. So that's certainly something that's possible and we'll definitely be introducing um, you know, some of the technologies that, that allow for that um, you know, further on down the line. So I, I hope that answers the question. And there is also um, a question, or I guess a concern regarding the considerations of seniors and those with limited mobility. Um, in addition to that, there was a question. I'm not exactly sure I understand the question. Uh, it reads that wheelchairs um, differently a lead need this curb cuts and it's a federal ADA law, is it not? Yes, yeah. So this is again, really critical issue. Um, part of our mapping process you know, is mapping um, where ADA parking spaces are, as well as where the ADA, um, you know, the accessible curb cuts are as well. Um, so it's certainly something we're trying to investigate very carefully. Um, I, I absolutely think that in our recommendations that come out of this plan, we want to propose some, you know, serious standards and, um, you know, strategies to make sure that when new construction does happen, um, that they really do follow through with adding, um, you know, those really critical pieces of infrastructure as well. Because again, we need to make sure our curbs are working for everyone. So um, definitely a, a really big priority for us. And another question, I guess, specifically more for the city is if the city has plans to make the ordinance that allows uh, curbside dining activations for restaurants and bars permanent, and how would this study incorporate any of these long-term discussions? Um, so that's a question that I'm not sure I can answer. Does anyone else from the project team have more information on that? Sorry, I get caught up reading the chat. What was the question? Um, if the city has any plans to make the ordinance that currently allows for curbside dining permanent. And also how will this study uh, incorporate any of these long-term discussions? Part A, uh, I am unsure of any plans to make um, sidewalk. Uh, well, let me clarify. There's a right of way dining legislation that was advanced and was codified in 2019 that allows for restaurants to um, seek and receive permits with the city to set up on publicly owned sidewalk. There's a process that's been in place for that. Since the pandemic um, set in, there is a process that further allows restaurants to seek the ability to, um, to essentially be in the street in some locations and be more expansive than that initial legislation from 2019 allowed. I anticipate just from a safety perspective and less uh, emergency orders uh, that they will pull back on the pandemic legislation and we will go back to the typical sidewalk or right-of-way dining, excuse me. And what was the second part of the question, Carmen? I'm sorry. How that will be incorporated into the study. I think like everything, we're, we're, we're trying to understand what the demands are and create recommendations that are flexible to allow for in this particular block at this location, this is what's being demanded and so whether it's scooters or sidewalk dining or a formal loading zone on street parking, a valet, just we want to create the flexibility to move from one use to another that is location specific and serving the demands of those users. So I, I hope that that answered the question. I think, I think the only other caveat is that um, as Jason mentioned earlier, uh, curbs can't be everything to everyone. And so we need to do a good job of thinking through what is the priority for all the various potential uses in um, basically every corridor in Midtown and Downtown. And we also have somebody who raised their hand, uh, Jay Mann. Thank you so much. I'm just going to segue, perhaps. I'm one of the few differently abled pedestrians who is on this webinar. I'm also a differently abled pedestrian who posted the video of the Roll a Mile on Our Wheels event where we invited the entire city council, any and everyone from the executive branch who chose to RSVP and no media, 
several, what, a year and a few months ago to roll on about 30 wheelchairs in um, the interest of just giving them the experience that I would like to convey to our colleagues up in Boston that sidewalks are also, especially in these critical corridors, state highways, they're also pedestrian byways. And the curb cuts that, that we're talking about, we often have to go out into the street because scooters and truck deliveries and cement builder trucks, et cetera, are constantly breaking down the sidewalks. And I'm, am I under the misimpression that it is federal law to have ADA accessible sidewalks? I haven't heard that until people started bringing it up in this presentation. I, I will take that one. And I acknowledge that there are some stretches throughout the city that certainly require um, more maintenance attention. And we know that the city is currently being sued um, for their lack of compliance with the federal ADA guidance. I, I'd like to reframe your question for this forum that's really focused on operations. I know that the, the maintenance is a, certainly a concern and equally as critical, but from an operation standpoint to maintain, assuming that the sidewalks are in pristine condition, um, the, the focus of this body would be really to be thinking about how if this, when the sidewalks are pristine, how they are clear for all users to move about um, in any way they desire to move. Is that a fair, um, friendly amendment? For an average abled person, that's a delightful restatement for a differently abled person. I and all of my brothers and sisters are looking for some equity. And so in our conversations, especially in the city of Atlanta, maybe we could start thinking not just in terms of bikes, automobiles, scooters, and start thinking in terms of prams, and wheelchairs and walkers and canes. And for this conversation, when I have seen all the chat roll out about e-scooters and everything else, I do agree with you that we're on a little different topic, but they are absolutely in intermingled. And I cannot just sit back and say, okay, someday there'll be a pie in the sky, good sidewalk. So let's exclude that part of this intermingled conversation. I think that's fair and your points are duly noted. Um, if you don't mind, I put my email in the chat and I will put it in the chat again. I'd like to connect with you offline um, because I think that this is going to just require different, um, different stakeholders, different team at the city um, that aren't on this call right now. And I don't, I'm not sure that the folks that are on the call are going to be able to help um, address your concerns. But I certainly appreciate what you stated because I do agree with you that these things work in tandem. Great, so I'll move it on to our next question. Um, early in the chat when we were discussing enforcement, there was a lot of agreement in that there's limited enforcement on, for sidewalk riding from scooters as well as parking and lit lanes. So one of the questions that was raised is how do you engage law enforcement to enforce loading zone rules in downtown? Great, that, that's an excellent question. And I think I can maybe shed some light on that as well. You know, part of our process has been to speak with, um, you know, law enforcement about, you know, what it looks like from their side of things. What are they able to do at the curb? How are they allocating resources? And of course, we've spoken with ATL Plus as well, who is the parking management and enforcement vendor. You know, again, I, I think it's a difficult situation, right? That requires a lot of coordination between all of these various law enforcement groups, whether it's MARTA PD, Atlanta PD, and others as well. And ATL Plus, again, one of the biggest barriers is that these safety violations, such as 
someone who's improperly parked in a loading zone or someone who's double parked in a bike lane. Um, those are not things that your typical on the ground, you know, ATL plus um, parking enforcement staff can, can deal with. Um, they just don't have the legal basis to deal with that. It does require actual law enforcement. Our sense right now is that due to staffing levels and priorities and various challenges, you know, Atlanta PD typically um, they're, they don't have the staff to be maybe as proactive as they'd like in dealing with these, but they certainly will respond, you know, promptly to any calls to deal with these specific issues. Um, but they're not, for example, conducting, you know, a regular sweep of all of downtown and midtown, um, you know, to catch all of these, these violations. So I think that's sort of the current situation. And our hope is that through this process, maybe we can draw a little bit more of the priority from law enforcement toward uh, dealing with some of these safety violations, parking in bike lanes, um, dealing with loading zones, et cetera. So um, that's definitely a, a priority for us. And, and we're hoping we can um, maybe push things in that direction. And aside from its enforcement, there is also a question about ordinances that are already in place by the city. So uh, one of the questions were if there are ordinances already in place that demand ideal curb management for future buildings in downtown and midtown, or is it that the city is only addressing retrofitting? Yeah, that's another great question. And I imagine um, others on the team may have a comment on that as well. Um, that's something we're trying to look closely at. Um, we want to understand when new development comes in, you know, through that permitting process, what is actually required of the developer in terms of things like, for example, estimating the demand for ride hailing based on, you know, a new mixed use development. Um, because a, a large scale development can certainly have drastic impacts on how any specific block or specific curb um, is being used, right? Our feeling is right now, maybe the um, demands placed on new development are not quite um, specific enough to, to allow the city, for example, to understand, okay, what is the new curbside demand generated by this development? Um, I think right now things are a little bit more focused on parking and not so focused on dealing with the ride hailing and the loading and the potential new transit service and bikes, et cetera, all these other things that happen um, at the curbside. So we do want to look closely at that and make sure that we're setting uh, the city up for success in the future as new development comes in. And I see that Jennifer Brooks has her hand raised. Uh, yes, I just wanted to um, amplify what JMAM was saying about ADA. In your presentation, you started off saying that your approach is a people first not vehicles. And I just want to be sure everybody's on the same page and that if we have ADA compliance, then those sidewalks are friendlier for everybody and more accessible for everybody. I wrote in the comment, um, I'll just use Baker Street as an example, uh, because as Jason, you mentioned, you're looking at what's working curbside management wise in other cities. A street like Baker, uh, just on a limited number of blocks, is unique in that the architecture itself, built in the 19, you know, late 60s, 70s, at a time where they were keeping people, pedestrians, off the street, uh, give give us limited amount of or limited flexibility in the curbside needs. So the curbside needs are huge. The transit needs are huge, as are access to the parking lots for those huge buildings. We've got huge John Portman architecture that has huge curbside needs. So that's a particular block that's unlike any other block in the country. So let's look at, and I'm sure in Midtown there are other blocks that are also unique. Um, this particular block has been you know, studied to death and I just find stakeholder meetings and public engagement and special interest groups don't yield uh, especially equitable or inclusive conversations. Uh, so that's something that as you look at this study of this big, huge area for curbside needs, there are unique areas that have to be handled in a 
unique way. I also posted my email address if I, you'd like to walk up and down that street with me. I'd be happy to um, help you understand just how special it is. Thanks so much, Jennifer. I mean, I think it's it's really awesome to hear from you and from others about these specific areas. And I just want to make sure that I got the exact block right. So if, do you mind um, repeating the exact location? Okay, Baker Street from Piedmont to Centennial Olympic Park. Perfect. Okay. So okay. Um, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right that um, there's, you know, each block can potentially be so unique and function so differently um, to, to have a truly successful management of any given block, you really have to understand the, the fine details. So that's why we're asking for so much of this geographic feedback. And I think, you know, later in the engagement process, and I believe at our next public workshop, our plan um, is to actually come to you with three specific examples of blocks or corridors that we've identified as having issues and really give people a chance to talk to us about what exactly is working or not working and what needs to change. Um, so, you know, places like the area that you mentioned are great candidates, um, you know, for, for something like that. So we appreciate that. I hope that helps. I'll throw out the next question. So how does this plan coordinate with shareable streets from North Avenue to Five Points? This eliminates curbs on Peachtree and Peachtree Center. I'm sorry, Carmen, I think I missed the very first part of that. Sorry. Uh, how does this plan coordinate with shareable streets from North Avenue to Five Points? This eliminates curbs on Peachtree and Peachtree Center. So I'm not sure I'm familiar with the specific program. So let me to, yeah. let me jump in for a second. The the team has not been briefed on the proposed project, uh, the shared spaces project on Peachtree Street. the The curb demands that are the curb demands needed to adapt to the the proposed 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 changes on Peachtree Street are being handled within that project. The, the team is currently responding to what is in place now um, on Peachtree Street, particularly in the, the extents that were mentioned. And for the good of the order, there is a project that is proposing um, a reduction of vehicle travel lanes on Peachtree Street within the core of downtown. And so obviously that would have an impact on how good services and people um, move about Peachtree Street. And earlier in the chat, there is also, oh, do we still have time for? Yeah, sorry, sorry, I, I hate to cut, cut us off, Carmen. Um, I think in the interest of time, since we do wanna save time for the breakout groups, as well as some of the live polling, um, I think we'll have to unfortunately move on um, from the question and answer, but of course, you'll all still have a chance to speak with us, um, you know, in our breakout groups as well. So, um, you know, with that, I'm just going to um, stop sharing my screen and move us to a very quick uh, live polling exercise. And just give me a moment to set that up. Just a couple questions to answer as a group, and then we'll go to our uh, breakout groups. Okay, is everyone able to see my screen? Car maybe Carmen, can you see it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Perfect. Um, okay, so some of you may have used this platform before. We just have a few very brief questions for you all to answer. Um, what we're asking you to do is go to www.menti.com. That's M-E-N-T-I.com and enter the code that you see here. Um, and it's going to bring you to um, you know, a series of questions, just some short questions for us to get a little bit more um, feedback from all of you. So I'll just um, give everyone a couple minutes to access the website and, and go ahead and answer.
Sorry, what's the code? Uh, so the code is up here at the very top of the screen and I, I can read it out as well. So it's 9673718. Thank you. You're welcome. Jason, can you clarify this question is relationship to downtown or downtown and midtown? Yes, this is just your relationship to downtown. And then in a moment, we'll ask for your relationship to Midtown as well. And it looks like we I do have I had about- I that before I answered because um, I answered incorrectly given that information. So it looks like we have about 60 participants right now in the meeting. So I'll just give um, another minute for everyone to, to get involved and then we'll move on to the next question. Okay, so just in the interest of time, just to uh, save time for our breakout groups, I'm gonna move on. So our next question, the same thing, what is your relationship uh, to Midtown? So again, this is just Midtown, um, not downtown. All right, great. And I think that was about as many responses as we had at the first question. So I'll just move us on um, to the next one. And again, you'll still be able to answer those others if you haven't already. Uh, but looking at our next question, what we're asking you to do is please rank uh, your priorities for Atlanta's curbside uses. So you can see we've given uh, nine options here and please go through those nine and just order them in you know, what is most important to you when we think about uh, the curbside. Great, and thank you all so much for, for answering these. This is again, so valuable to our team, uh, you know, to really help make sure that we're focusing on, on the right things and um, you know, coming up with a plan that, that really works for the community. So thank you. Um, it looks like that's just about everyone on this question. And um, I'll just move us on in the interest of time to our last question for you before we go to our breakout groups. And here we're asking you to please rank the key curbside issues that you experience in Atlanta. Um, there is an other option as well, um, but you can see the nine options here. Again, please just order them in, in you know, what you experience the most or, or what is the biggest issue that, that you feel out of this list.
Okay, so we just have a couple minutes left for this. And again, you'll be able to continue filling this out. And, uh, you know, Matt, I'll just ask um, you in another minute or two to walk us through uh, the engagement exercise and get us set up in our breakout rooms. Okay, I'll get this, um, wait for a couple more people to get their responses in. And I'll just start kind of speaking, hopefully. Um, this works for people who are still doing the exercise, but we're going to do a breakout. We're going to put you all into um, Zoom rooms. So um, some of you have probably experienced that before. So we kind of are creating little micro meetings of this meeting and we've pre-assigned everyone into a room unless you joined a little bit late, in which case you might not be in a room yet. And we kind of have to wait until we move everyone and then we'll get you into a room. So if you don't get an assignment right away, just give us a couple minutes and we'll get you into a room, but that shouldn't be too much of an issue. Um, so what we're going to do is create those rooms and then we're also going to use an interactive board called Miro. So you're going to be doing two things. You're gonna maintain your Zoom connection, but you're also going to click a link, which will match up to the room you're being assigned to. And I'll put those into the chat. So um, if you're assigned to room one, you'll click the link associated with room one. Um, so I wanna share my screen and just kind of walk you through um, uh, what's going to happen here. Okay. So when you click on a link that we will post into the chat box, you will get to a screen pretty similar to this. Um, there's a lot of content here. If you have a big screen or really great eyes, you probably think this view is perfect. Um, if you need to zoom in, there's a little button down here on the right and you can zoom in on things, zoom out, um this box down here on the lower right it may or may not automatically appear when you click the link you can make it disappear so that by clicking there if it hasn't appeared you just go over here put your cursor over the the zoom level and you'll be able to zoom in zoom out um also when you join you might have your cursor look like this little hand um you can do the exercise with your cursor looking like that, but it will be easier if you come over here and click the little um, arrow or pointer. It'll just make your life a little bit easier as you work through the exercise. Another thing I want to point out is as other people join, you'll be able to see their cursors moving around. If that's really distracting to you, you can come up here to the upper right and click to hide the collaborator's cursors so that you won't see a bunch of cursors moving around the screen. But sometimes it's nice to see those, so it's kind of up to you. So that's a little bit of the basics of like using this tool, but what are we actually asking you to do? So what we've done is we wanted to provide you a little bit of context and get you to respond to very specific scenarios and different uses of the curve. And so what we have are a handful of photos, and we're asking you to look at those as a group, kind of one photo at a time, and think, what are features you like about that photo? What are features you don't like? And we have little sticky notes for you. And we're asking you to fill out the, the sticky notes, um, just filling out like, okay, using green if there's things you like, yellow for things you don't necessarily like. And as you work on that, kind of think through like, well, is it a certain context that I think this is appropriate in? but perhaps in other contexts, it's not appropriate. We'd like you to add that kind of information to the sticky note, um, or uh, you maybe support it, um, you know, as, as kind of some examples of, I think this is great in an area where there's lots of residential, but I don't necessarily think it works in an area where there's lots of restaurants and uh, other types of activities. So just kind of think through that. Um, so how you'll do this exercise, so you just click on um, one of these little uh, um, sticky notes and you're able to then type in it. So as an example, let's say I'm looking at this one that has some on-street bicycle park or parking. And what has happened here is we're just telling, letting you know that on-street parking was repurposed for bike and e-scooter parking. So you might think, yeah, that's great. We should totally be doing that. And so you'd fill out your sticky note, turn it up here. But maybe you actually think, you know what, I don't think there is enough parking. 
uh, we shouldn't be taking over car parking spaces for bicycle parking and e-scooters. So I don't really support this. And you can fill out your sticky note and drag it up there. Um, and then if you're of course thinking, well, but there's maybe certain contexts where I do approve of it and other contexts where I don't, let us know that. Um, and you can just drag these around. After you've filled out the sticky, you typically wanna click out of it and then click back with the sticky. It'll make life a little bit easier for you. Um, so with that, I am going to move you into groups, but I do wanna let you know in each group, with the exception of groups six and eight, but I'll be visiting both of you. Um, you'll have a facilitator so they can answer any questions you have. And if you somehow run into problems and you don't have access to a facilitator, you can come back to the main meeting and we're gonna have someone sitting there waiting to help you. Uh, the other thing, if somehow your link, you can't get the Miro link to work for you, um, maybe just ask your facilitator and they can share your screen and you can work from that and kind of see what's happening. So there's lots of flexibility, lots of options. Um, I am going to right now copy the links, but I'm going to wait um, into the chat. And then what I'm going to do is assign you to your rooms. So you'll join your room and then sign, click on the link that's associated with your room. So we're going to open all those rooms up right now and encourage you to head over to those. And I will stop my screen share.